It's the Griot Nation News, where we give you the best of activism and journalism. Peace, Griot Nation. Y'all know who it is. It's the capital UNC and the Griot Nation Radio. We're here at the headquarters, or actually here with um, Bernie Mr. Bernard Tobit, yes sir, and he's running for sheriff. And what we wanted to do is basically um, get some information from Mr. Tobit himself concerning issues in our community, as well as give him an opportunity to explain what he brings for change to our community. First of all, Mr. Tobit, how's it going? Look doing well, thank you. Good to see you. Yes sir, good, good to see you also. Um, would you explain the role of the sheriff, um, of, of county sheriff for Erie, sure. for Erie County? Sure, for the people that don't know. Yeah, actually, uh, basically there are 3,000 plus sheriffs across the United States. No. And each sheriff is the, the sheriff is a ch the chief elected law enforcement official in the county. So here in Erie County, the sheriff serves as the chief law enforcement uh, officer for the county. The sheriff has several responsibilities. Obviously, the number one responsibility of the sheriff's office is public safety. Yes, sir. The sheriff exists to make sure that the public is safe. And in addition to that public safety described broadly, one of the main things that the sheriff's office does, certainly here in your county, is oversees the holding <coughs> center. Yes, sir. And the jail responsible for prisoners. That, and that's pretty much the case across Across counties in the United States, the sheriff is responsible for housing prisoners. Uh, also, the sheriff's department here in Erie County have a, a part of the, the organization it's called the Road, Road Patrol. And the Road Patrol does just what its, what its name says it tra travels the roads of Erie County, uh, uh, enforcing the laws, again, ensuring that people are safe. Here in Erie County, we have a number, we have 20, we have three cities and then to another 25 towns and villages. In the, the the cities have their own police departments, the large uh, towns have their police department, but some of the smaller towns don't. And it's the sheriff's office who patrols, basically provides the police services for those towns. So, like for example, here in Erie County, Springville, it doesn't have its own police department, so the sheriff's department uh, patrols and, and things like that. So, uh, and then there are a number of other uh, responsibilities that a sheriff carries, carries out, all related to law enforcement and public safety. A big part of what the sheriff's office should be doing is working with other law enforcement agencies yes, in the jurisdiction to make sure that we're that uh, they're talking together, that they have a good idea of what's going on, so that you're not uh, out there functioning by yourself in the stovepipe, so you're not duplicating efforts to the extent possible, and so that your resources are being used wisely. So, in a nutshell, that's what a sheriff does. Yes, sir. A lot of people would be happy to to understand the role a lot of times, you know, it's driven by media and it's driven as a knee-jerk reactionary process to events that take place in our community. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues that has been seriously um, on the table has been police brutality, so-called police terrorism. Um, what are your viewpoints on what is the real systemic issue and, and, how, and, and what can we look forward to and how you would address it? Well, I think by and large, uh, within police departments across the country, and it's certainly true here in Western New York. I think police departments, the, the staff in the police departments, by and large, the majority of them are hardworking, dedicated professionals. Yes, uh, unfortunately, you always have a, an instance or two or, you know, where there's some who don't adhere to that, and they um, they give everyone a bad name. I'll go back. Uh, I was the uh, special agent in charge of the FBI here in Buffalo yes, some sir. years ago before I retired. And part of what the FBI investigates is police corruption. And that, that would make you think, well, there's a huge problem with police corruption across the department. Right. Well, typically it's not. Typically there's some few, like I said, who give everyone else a bad name. Right. So I, 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 in terms of, obviously, it's, it's unacceptable. Uh, Absolutely. The, the, the fact that you care, you you wear a badge and carry a gun, does not give you the authority to abuse, trample on, disrespect anyone's rights, their human rights and their civil rights. So, as a law enforcement professional, retired law enforcement professional, I say there's no place in law enforcement for those who think they're above the law. Right. Think that uh, because they're a police officer, they don't have to follow the rules, follow the guidelines, and, and, and it's up to all of us to weed those people out. Uh, and when we do, uh, police departments will have a better reputation. So f as a sheriff, it's, it's 
goes without saying that it's unacceptable for any officer or sheriff's deputy to um, not be in, in lockstep with the rules, uh, not only the department of rules, but the, the rules that gov that are, you know, there's some law laws that that talk about police officers and what you can and can't do. Right. We have to do things in a way that the public will have faith and confidence in us. So if we're going to uh, use a, an intrusive technique, let's say wiretapping somebody on their phone, listening to what they're saying, those are very intrusive. People yes, have an expectation of privacy. And the only way we should be doing that is we have a court order signed by a judge that says, after looking at the facts on, in an affidavit that says, yeah, I, based on what I've seen, there's reason to believe that that's uh, necessary in order to get the job done. Absent a, a law for an order signed by a judge, we shouldn't be doing it. We can't operate outside the law. I said all the time when I was an FBI agent, if we resort to doing what the bad guys do, we're no better than Yes, them. sir. Yes, sir. Good point. Uh, you mentioned the community. What what would you see need to take place and what would you do to bridge the gap between police officers and the community? Well, let, let me tell you something that I did. When I came to Buffalo as a special agent, I'm from Buffalo. I was born and raised here. Grew up in the Willard Park projects. And yes, sir. Lived in all different parts of the city, mostly on the east side, and certainly as a young man. And um, so I knew my city. But I didn't know any FBI agents. I didn't know not one. Right. Uh, you know, I couldn't pick an FBI agent out of a crowd of two. Because yes, I just sir. didn't know any. Most of us don't. So, so and then when I came back as the agent in charge, one of the things that I, I realized very quickly is that the FBI here in Buffalo wasn't as well connected with the community as I thought it should be and I would like it to be. And when I say with the community, I mean all phases, all parts of our community. The FBI serves everyone. So it shouldn't be a part of the community that, that felt it's not my FBI. So I started a program called the FBI Citizens Academy. And I remember mm -hmm. telling the people when I first came on the first day, I remember telling my staff that I want a cross a, a cross section of community representation. I want people from a grassroots community. That means block club presidents, um, you know, activists, whoever. I wanted uh, business community, business leaders. I wanted the education community and the faith community. And I brought them together. And, and let me just say, I had a, there was some pushback from the agents. They thought, mm -hmm. oh, that's, that's social work or, and I'm a social worker by the way, I have a master's in social work before oh, I did sorry. anything else, I, that's what I told But, but I, I explained to them, well, we have to make sure we're connected with the community for a couple of reasons. One is, when we need the community, we shouldn't be going out for the first time saying we need your help. Right. They should know who we are, they're more, they're more likely to be helpful if they know us and they've been a part of what we do. But also, in order to discharge our mission, to uh, investigate laws in the United States, uh, to the full extent, we need to be, we can do that more effectively if we get cooperation and help from people. So I started this program, the Citizens Academy, we brought, uh, like I said, the cross-section of people together into our offices for six consecutive weeks, three hours a night, uh, one night a week, and we taught them, we told them everything about the FBI, and I like to describe it as the good, the bad, and the ugly yes, about the FBI. They, we talked to them about the case, what our responsibilities are, the kinds of cases we work, how we do it. We let them do hands-on things like, you know, take fingerprints and do plaster mold casting, all the oh, things wow. that we do. And we also uh, let them, uh, we have a system called FATS, Firearms Training System. It's a shoot, don't shoot type of thing where you're really looking at a screen. And we let them uh, do that so they can see what, what police officers or FBI agents go through when you confronted with a situation where you have to decide very quickly, do I, is this a bad guy mm -hmm. when I shoot them? And, and, and it opened the eyes of some of the people. We also took them out to the range where we fired at them. And they, some of them brought family with them, let them shoot all the guns we used, the, the, the pistols, the uh, M16s, shotguns. Again, somewhat for fun and entertainment, but more so that they can see what it's like. It, it's, it's not quite what you see on TV. Unfortunately, right. people watch a lot of TV and they Absolutely. see things and they, and they say, well, why didn't you shoot the gun out of his hand or why didn't you, you know, shoot him in the leg and wound him? Well, that's just not the way it works in mm -hmm. real life. So, so anyway, that was a very successful program and to this day, it's still going on and I started that program back in 1998, I believe. And it's available for citizens of Buffalo? It, it, it's available for citizens of Buffalo. Uh, when I started, it, it was, again, to bring in a cross sex. If someone's interested, I'm no longer involved with the FBI, of course, right. but I would ask that, you know, they should call the FBI. Eight, five, eight, Oh boy, eight five six seventy eight hundred, I believe the name is. But check and they have that buffalo off and tell them you'd like to participate, and they can can go from there. 
um, when I when I first started, it was difficult getting that first class of 25 people because mm -hmm. people didn't trust us. Absolutely. Why do you want me down there? What are you going to do? You're trying to make me into right. a snitch right. and all kinds of things. But after we got going, the word spread like wildfire. And people who went started telling others. And to this day, I still get calls from people saying, "Can you get me into the FBI Academy?" So, 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 so your question was, what would I do? I would do things like that. Absolutely. I would do things that let the community know we're interested in you, and we want to be a part of what you do. We want you to look at us as a resource for you. That's why we're here. So, if someone has something that fits in with our with our mission and our responsibility is, I would hope they'd be calling us. And the best way to get them to do that is make sure they know what your responsibilities are, what you do, and uh, they're comfortable with you. Absolutely. Um, you made a very good point in terms of media. How would you effectively use media as the head of the police department to bridge the gap between? Because it's the first level of influence on everybody's um, plate today. Sure. Well, one thing is you have to, I think it's incumbent upon you to be honest with the media and open. You have that kind of relationship so that they know that you're dealing with them fairly. Uh, now, now there, there are times when you, you a media person may have a story. Right. They'll approach you and say, here's the story. And it might compromise an investigation you're doing. Or you might be at a point in an investigation where we just can't let it, it out yet. Right. And, and if you have the right relationship, you might get them to hold that story to give you a chance to finish up what you have to do before the, the bad guys, the pre people, the targets of your investigation are alerted and, and run and flee or whatever. But um, I've always dealt with them. When I was uh, in the FBI, I've always dealt with the media openly and honestly. If there were things that we had going on, they asked about them. Uh, we would tell them. Uh, I didn't like to say no comment. Sometimes there are things you can't say for, right. like you said, it might compromise an investigation. Sometimes there are confidentiality considerations. You know, people have a right to confidentiality. If it's not something, if it's something that's going to, uh, like I said earlier, you can't walk over people's rights. If they have a right to confidentiality, then you know you don't you don't share those kinds right. of things un unless you have their permission. But I, you know, I, by my dealing with the media openly and honestly, they're they're a great resource. For law enforcement, you know, when things happen, how often do you see somebody on the newscaster say something saying, if you have any information, call this tip line or right, call the right. Buffalo Police or call the FBI. So so in that sense, we use them uh, to help us do what we have to do. But again, it has to be a two-way street. No doubt. And, and that's exactly what I was talking about. I was going over a, a, a coin in my mind that had two sides to it and transparency and information with the public. The police officers and the police department being transparent and then the public actually having access to information. How do we how do we make this this marriage work? Well, <clears throat> access to information is uh, an important consideration, <clears throat> but there's also, uh, we have to keep in mind that all information uh, is not accessible right. for various reasons. Some of it you're restricted by law. Yes, sir. Some, of, some of it, like I said earlier, are confidentiality considerations where people have a right that that not be known. And if it, but if it's public information, publicly available, or it should be publicly available, then yeah. And then publicly, how do we get to it? Well, there, there's a number of ways. And oftentimes, if, in today's world with uh, computers and internet and things like that, much of the stuff is out there on the internet. So if people are astute, you know, you Google somebody's name or you Google a, a certain topic and it'll bring up a lot of things. More information is available than, than we can imagine. Um, so, so that's one way. The other way is you can go directly to, um, uh, to an organization, for example, the Sheriff's Department. You can file what's called a Freedom of Information FOIL request and, and say, I'd like to have this kind of information. And again, if it's something that's available, doesn't Legal. compromise cases, doesn't yes, compromise sir. someone's privacy, you have a right to that and you can get that. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. That's 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 good information. We often say, you know, we don't know we don't know what's happening and, and, and I think we the avenues a lot of times we're, we're unclear mm -hmm. about how to get it done because a lot of people want to know. Well one another and another way of getting that I think that uh, departments, police departments, sheriff's offices can do, and, and they do, is they put information out to the media in terms of advisories, alerts, and, and again, it's up to the media what they publish, whether it's a newspaper or, uh, or a TV station, the print or um, <clears throat> the electronic media, but if, if you put out information, for example, these things, a lot of times you'll see that someone's having, the, the mayor, for example, in Buffalo, uh, Byron Brown, he has a gun buyback program. And he advertises that. It's on billboards 
that get it out to the people. It's, it's uh, advertised in newspapers and it's on TV. That's one way of getting out. People have to, to be able to access that information, have access to it. But um, so it's up to the problem. We have a responsibility to get stuff out to people that you know, whether it's things like a gun bag bag program or a new initiative on the part of uh, that we're going to be doing, something we're going to be doing. And sometimes it's an alert to say there's a, a crime problem in this particular area and this is what's going on. Be alert. Maybe it's someone going door to door scamming people. Maybe it's somebody breaking into homes. Right. A, so those are things that we would put out and uh, ask people. Hopefully the media will publish it and people will have will become aware of it. Yes, sir. The hold it, sir. First thing I did when I came to Buffalo, I was in a protest of the holdings. Um, due to certain policies, things that had taken place with cases I'd heard of. I came from Dallas. So I'm really unfamiliar with Buffalo. We were on the, been on the air for six years, WBLK, number one at the time slot. So we did a lot in the community before we came in terms of trying to be aware and understand what was happening. First thing I heard about was conditions at the holdings. I know that that's very dear to you and um, it's something that you have on your agenda to take care of. Um, what do you see the issues are and how do you plan on approaching them? Well, the issues in the holding center are, are numerous um, and it's something that I, I do want to, uh, I, when I first announced my candidacy, I talked about uh, three areas that I was going to focus on. One was the holding center that I was going to focus on right away because clearly, like you said, that everyone's aware of the fact that there's an issue in the holding center. Um, you, clearly, you, the, the button I'm wearing, that says the number 22, that's 22 people have died mm -hmm. in the holding center and in, in, in the correctional facility and all the jail under our uh, current sheriff's watch, under Tim Howard's watch. That 22 is five times the national average, which to me is unacceptable, totally unacceptable. People in Erie County deserve better. And uh, so we want to look at, you know, what's behind that, you know, training of, of uh, officers who work in, uh, and staff who work in the holding center. Certainly some of the things that have been, sometimes we put them in a bad position. Uh, there's a lot of uh, overtime, double time shifts that they have to work. And I think that's, that's very dangerous to the extent that uh, if, if you work in a, a double shift and you're in hour number 12 or 15 of your work, there's no way you're going to be sharp and on your game right. like you are in the first shift. And just the nature of the facility is such that things go on that um, you know it's not like working in the bank where it's a nice environment. You right. got people who are who don't want to be there first of all the, the inmates and and, and there, there's some hostility. So all of that uh, goes towards making the job very difficult. And I think we have to make sure that our um, correctional uh, staff. Uh, is, is able to do their job. We shouldn't push them to the point where they're ineffective. And, and, and I think that's part of what it is. So we've got an issue with all that training. Uh, you know, th there's, a, there's been a lot of um, things that have happened in the whole thing where, where I've heard with guys that we weren't properly trained or we didn't have the training. The Richard Metcalf case, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. That was a, um, a young man who um, uh, died after being in the holding center for a short time and clearly he had some mental health issues. Right. And the way that all came about was um, was uh, it shouldn't have happened. If, if we had better trained guards, if we had people who were more familiar with the kinds of uh, procedures they used, the spit mask and all that, it wouldn't have happened. So we got to look at the overtime, we got to look at the, 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 the uh, uh, training and the resources. I've heard the number, I've heard from 50 to 80 percent of the people who go into the, into the holding center have mental health issues. Yes, sir. Well, if that's the case, we start from a point where mixing people with mental health issues with criminals might not be a good thing to do. Now, I've also talked to judges who said, I don't want to put certain people to the holding center, but I have no choice. So maybe we could look at some alternatives. There's some better ways that we can do that. You know, I, I, I'm not saying that we can, but it, it's worth exploring. Again, our people, our citizens, Mary County deserve the very best that we can give them. Yes, sir. And if we can find a better way, then we should look at that. Uh, but in terms of those mental health issues, I'd like to bring more resources into the holding center, uh, more uh, social work resources, more you know, psychology, uh, psychiatric resources, so that when a person's in the middle of a mental health crisis, Someone recognizes that and says they're not just being belligerent, hard to get, do, or disobedient, hard to deal with. They have some issues. Well, let's take them and get them evaluated. Maybe you know, send them to the ECMC for evaluation. Something. Um, all of that will make the holding center a better place, in, in my estimation. 
Uh, and, and there are a host of other issues that we have to look at as it relates to the holding center. But uh, I got to get into the office. Yes, sir. So that, I, so that we can do that. Okay. Um, mental health. How much do you see that being an issue with officers on the street? And if so, how is it addressed in the department? When you say mental health, you mean the mental health? The, the mental health of the actual office. Well, because a lot of times when, when we question, when I see some of the egregious cases of police brutality, men, immediately I think about, is this is officer saying? Because not, not, not because it's, it's, it's not because I'm demonized, but because I know the work is stressful. Mm -hmm. I know the alcoholism rate is is something um, nationally around 40 to 48 percent. And so we are concerned as citizens about the people that are protecting us. Mm -hmm. And what is the protection for them so that they can be healthy? Well, I, I think most in most police departments that I'm familiar with, the law enforcement agency, uh, officers go through some very intensive training. Part of the background process includes an evaluation, I, you know, some uh, on some level, uh, an evaluation to uh, make sure that they're the right person for the job. So I, I, I don't know that I've, in my career, have run across a lot of officers that have mental health issues. Okay. But that being said, if there are, in most departments, there are programs that are available, EAP, okay. employee assistance programs, they can get that up, and I would, I would hope that they would. Uh, but one of the things that's important for me as a sheriff is to make sure that my staff have available to them all the things that they need to do yes, the job. Sir. Remember, I keep going back to the people in Erie County deserve the very best sheriff's department they can have. That means they deserve the best officers. And if we have an officer or sheriff's officer, a deputy who needs some help in any kind of area, then it's important for us to be able to provide that help, which means we have to have in place uh, things that the officers will feel comfortable going to. Yes, sir. So um, I, I don't. I, I think again, based on my experience, uh, I, I've not seen. Well, I've always said we all we all have mental health issues. Absolutely. All of okay. us. Okay. Okay. Right. Sometimes I've as a grown man, yes, I may break down and cry. Over Absolutely. Something. Some Absolutely. People, some people might say that's mental, you know, mental health. Right. Well, so we all have issues. And, and we all have emotions to deal with, but that doesn't mean we have mental health problems. So I don't think many police officers have mental health problems, but I, I think when there are when those do exist, we, all of us who are involved, have to make sure that we we're we're, we're attuned to that. Right. And we get them to help you. I, I just know it's, it's reasonable uh, with a high stress position, oh, uh, absolutely. a position absolutely. that can be high stress. Absolutely. And with all the misconceptions and media involved and everything, I I'm not I'm a proponent of everybody being healthy. Mm -hmm. That's critical, and especially in a situation with law enforcement and and citizens. So with that being the case, um, I actually work, you know, dealing in, in health and wellness myself. And so I, I would like to see more progressive programs, more um, holistic programs for police officers and things of that nature that, you know, that we could all work together on. But you said something very important. You said you know that it's a high stress position. Absolutely. It absolutely is. Um, you know, having, you know, been in law enforcement, I've had this situation. So, and I always said to myself, am I, if I'm in these critical situations, I hope my training kicks in. Because you don't have time as a police officer to think, okay, now what do I do? If someone's going and reaching, you don't know if they're reaching for a gun or a weapon or something that can hurt you. Um, so you have to take that into consideration. So it's a high stress position. So that's all the more reason we have to make sure that services are available to law enforcement officers. And that's another reason why we can't overwork them and overtask them. Right. We can't put them in positions where they're not sharp as they can be. Where, you know, they're, as I said, pushing them beyond the point where they're effective. That's why I want to take a look at uh, the overtime issue, how we schedule, can we schedule better so that we don't have to have as many people working on it. There's always going to be a need for overtime, I understand that, but it should be, it should be such that uh, the officers still have the, the, what they need to take care of themselves. That means take care of their mental health. Yes, sir. Every county sheriff already told me, what does Buffalo look like five years after you're in office? Five years after I'm in office? Well, certainly I hope, it, it's my hope that my plan, that the sheriff's department is one that will be a functioning at a very high level of efficiency and a high level of effectiveness. And people in Erie County will look to the sheriff's department and say, that's my sheriff, that's my sheriff, that's my sheriff's department, I'm proud of them. That's, that's what I want to make sure I accomplish. Because that's what the people of Erie County deserve, nothing less.
Okay, right, now I've, I've been in Buffalo a short period. I heard it's very segregated. I'm learning the community. Um, I couldn't end without asking you about racism and what do you feel like it is or if it's an issue in the police department and how do people see the police department. Because again, media creates a lot of misconceptions and I want to give, give everybody a chance to get the real truth. You, you've been a man on the inside. You've been at the high levels of the FBI. So, um, are we just dreaming, or is that, or is that an issue? Are we just dreaming? What sense that that doesn't exist? In the sense exist? that media, no, not that it doesn't exist, oh. but that that that's, that there is actually an issue with it. Because with the current president, it's a lot of misconceptions and a lot of things happening right now. Mm -hmm. And anytime we see law enforcement, we will always relate that to the chief officer, which is the president. Right. That's just a natural as a matter of fact. World, I mean, uh, worldview of policing uh, is, is getting more on a, a militarized concept level in the people's mind. Not saying that it's an actual fact. So I want to talk to somebody to say, hey, is that is that really an issue? And if you saw it to be an issue, then how would we handle it? Well, let, let me say, as a law enforcement professional, someone who's been in law enforcement and had worked with law enforcement officials across this country at all levels, uh, from the patrolmen on the street to the chiefs of police and to the heads of federal agencies. Uh, uh, I, I've had a chance to do that. And I would say I'm very proud of the work I've done and I'm very proud of uh, people I've worked with. I think our police departments are a microcosm of our society. So um, you, you don't want people in our, to, be, to yes, be racist or anything, but you know, we draw our police officers from our society. So you're gonna you, you're gonna run into those things. I think it's important for all of us to understand that um, we need to stand up and speak out against those things that are good, uh, whether it's racism, uh, brutality, for any reasons. You know, and so I'm not I'm not prepared to say that the Erie County Sheriff's Department or the Buffalo Police or any other police department is rife with racism because I don't believe that. Absolutely. I don't believe that. Yes, sir. You've got a lot of very dedicated, hardworking professionals who want to do a good job, who want to make their community better. That being said, where, the, where those instances where that we have a problem, it's important for us to weed it out. It's important for, for me as a sheriff to make sure that I identify people who may be like that and, and then try to get help them to understand that what my plan is, what my goal is, what's acceptable, what's not, the things I will and won't tolerate. And if you can't work within that, then I think they would need to find another job. But I stand uh, against racism, clearly. Yes, sir. Um, and I will do, I will always fight against racism uh, anywhere I find it, not only in, um, in, in the sheriff's office or in law enforcement, but you know, in other segments of our community. What, what, what has been, in, a, in this promises the last question, but you're so interested in everything, so I'm, I'm very um, intrigued. Um, not often do we have an opportunity to sit down with someone from the inside, if you will, and get real questions answered. Um, officers who witness wrongdoing by other officers, it's our, it's our perception that they get off, that they cover for other police officers. What What is the mechanism inside the police department, besides internal affairs, that deals with the, the gang mentality, if you will. Well, let, let me, I, gang mentality, I, I wouldn't. Well, I mean, that, that I particular I, principle I, I, is I get to, I concept, what you're but I'm not saying. You're, you're talking within the department? Yes, sir, absolutely. Um, you mentioned internal affairs, and that's what most um, most departments have an internal affairs division who looks at those things. When I was in the, in the FBI, we had what's called OPR. That's just for the Office of Professional Responsibility. That was the internal group watchdog that when there was an allegation of wrongdoing on the part of an FBI agent, that they would conduct the investigation. And so it's like an, a police department's internal affairs division. Um, I think that I've, I've said earlier that um, when if we do what they do, we're no better than the guys we go, people we're yes, going sir. after. And I firmly believe that. So I th but I understand, and there's a concept of what they call the blue line. So it's an us against them mentality. Yes, you know, we all have to fight to overcome that. So, so that doesn't just, things like those FBI Citizens Academy I talked about where we bring people in so they can see that it's not us against them. I remember very clearly in one of our Citizens Academy, somebody said, you guys are just like my neighbors. 
because mm -hmm. they didn't know FBI agents. Yes, they sir. just to them it was somebody you'll miss you with a, a trench coat behind hide behind every tree looking at people. It's important to understand we're just like the rest of, of the, the, the people in our society and our and our communities. Uh, we're fathers, mothers, uncles, and aunts. You know, our kids play on little league uh, football teams and little league baseball teams, and we go to churches like everybody. So it's important for people to understand that that's how we are. I, I would like to say that I wish there was no concept of that blue line, but I know it exists. Uh, and I think we have to work on both sides. One, making sure that people un un understand the police officer better, and that the police have a better tie in it and involved with their community, so we lose that. Here in Buffalo, we've had a number of homicides uh, that are unsolved, and in many of them, it's because people have witnessed what happened, but they won't come forward. And they won't come forward because they don't trust law enforcement. They don't trust that if I mm -hmm. tell the police officer what I saw, I, I won't. they won't tell somebody and I'll be at risk myself. So we've got to find a way to overcome those, and I'm committed to doing that. But just let me say that within any law enforcement agencies, um, if, if, if we allow uh, our brother law enforcement officers to do things that are wrong, that are illegal, then we're only lowering um, the concept and the professionalism of the entire department. So, um, you know, I, I, again, I hate to you know keep referring to things that I've done, but when I was an FBI agent, I went on a, 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 a went on a um, we had a warrant, we were doing a search, we were doing a search, and we were looking for something like televisions or sets or something that was stolen off of a train, and. Um, I can remember one of the agents was looking in a drawer, and my first thought was, the television set isn't inside that drawer. You get a warrant, it says with specificity what you're looking for. This is a search when we're looking for a good stone, you know, televisions or whatever it was. So it, it's hard to justify going through someone's dresser drawer when you're looking for TVs. And if you found something, you couldn't use it because the judge would throw it out because that's clearly outside the scope of the warrant. And I remember saying that we, we can't do that. We should be doing that. So I think it's up to everyone to just uh, do the best we can to make sure we raise the, the professionalism uh, of the entire department. But it's important for us to be partners with the community. Uh, you know, this, this concept of the blue line, us against them, won't go away as long as there's this division where the people don't trust the police and the people feel that everybody's in the police with everybody's against them. That's huge. I, I certainly appreciate your time. Um, not pleasure. often do we have a chance to sit down with somebody on the inside, like I said once before. I think it's very uh, important that we continue dialogues like this. I want to offer my platform as a 3 our nation and everything that we do. Anytime you're ready, okay. you can come on. Okay. Um, I appreciate that. That's radio, social media, everything that we do. So thank you very much, sir. You're very welcome. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.